bursting into the studio carrying this dirty potted plant. And he's emotional, practically on the verge of tears, and he comes rushing into the studio and thrusts this pot into my arms, and he says, I'm just here to tell you I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way I treated you. I've been seeing you on TV, I've been seeing you on the news, you're out there trying to fight for our people, and I shouldn't have treated you that way. I'm here to tell you I'm sorry. That I would have bought you some flowers, I don't have a job, I don't have any money, I snatched this plant off my grandma's house. <laughs> 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 he gave it to me. And then he turns around and runs out the door. I go chasing after him. <clears throat> he jumps in his broke down car and speeds away. Several months after that, I'm in my office, I open up the newspaper. What's on the front page? The Oakland Riders police scandal is broke. Mm. Turns out that a gang of police officers, otherwise known as a drug task force, had been planting drugs on suspects, beating folks up in his neighborhood, and who's identified as one of the main officers accused of planting drugs on suspects and beating folks up? The officer he identified to me is having planted drugs on him and beat up him and his friends. And it was only then that the light bulb finally came on for me and I realized, he's right about me. I am no better than the police. The minute he told me he was a felon, I just stopped listening. I couldn't hear what he had to say. And I came to realize that my real crime wasn't in refusing to represent an innocent man. My real crime was in refusing to allow the millions of people who we view as guilty from ever having their stories told or their voices heard. And that was the beginning of me asking myself some hard questions about myself as a civil rights lawyer. How am I actually replicating many of the very forms of discrimination, exclusion, and marginalization I'm supposedly fighting against? And I also started asking myself, why is it that we haven't been able to find one young black man in his neighborhood they haven't got to yet? What is really going on here? So I started doing an enormous amount of research. And I started listening more carefully to the stories of those cycling in and out of prison. And what I learned in that process truly blew my mind. Here are a few of the facts that I covered in the course of that work that I described in the book. More African American adults are under correctional control today, in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850 a decade before the Civil War began. More black men, as of 2004, more black men disenfranchised than in 1870, the year the 15th Amendment was ratified, prohibiting laws that explicitly deny the right to vote on the basis of race. Now, of course, during the Jim Crow era, poll taxes and literacy tests operated to keep black folks from the polls. Well, today, felon disenfranchisement laws accomplish what poll taxes and literacy tests ultimately could not be. <coughs> this is not some phenomenon. This phenomenon of mass incarceration isn't some phenomenon that affects just a small segment of the African American community. No. In many large urban areas, more than half of working age African American men have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. In fact, right here in Chicago, if you take into account prisoners who are excluded from poverty statistics and excluded from unemployment data, you know, thus masking the severity of racial inequality in the United States, but if you actually count prisoners as people in the Chicago area, nearly 80% of working age African American men have criminal records and are thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. These men are part of a growing undercast, not class, caste, a group of people defined largely by race who are relegated to a permanent second class status by law. Now, I'm sure that more than a few might be skeptical 
might be thinking to themselves, what is she talking about? Our criminal justice system isn't a system of racial control, it's a system of crime control. And if black folks would stop running around committing so many crimes, they wouldn't have to worry about being locked up and then stripped of their basic civil and human rights. But therein lies the greatest myth about mass incarceration, namely that it's been driven by crime and crime rates. It's just not true. It's not true. Our prison population has exploded, has quintupled, not doubled or tripled, quintupled in a 30-year period of time. We went from a prison population of about 300,000 to now well over 2 million. We now have the highest rate of incarceration in the world, greater than even highly repressive regimes like Russia or China or Iran. But again, this is not simply explainable by crime, crime rates. Over the past 30 years, crime rates have fluctuated, have gone up, have gone down. Today, crime rates are actually at historical lows nationally, but incarceration rates especially black incarceration rates, have consistently soared. Most criminologists and sociologists today will acknowledge that crime rates in the United States have moved independently of one another. Incarceration rates, especially black incarceration rates, have soared, regardless of whether crime is going up or going down in any given community or the nation as a whole. So what explains this sudden, sudden un unprecedented explosion in incarceration, you know, the emergence of a penal system unprecedented <coughs> in world history, if not crime and crime rates? Well, the answer is the war on drugs in the Get Tough movement, the wave of punitiveness that washed over the United States. Drug convictions alone, just drug convictions, accounted for about two-thirds of the increase in the federal prison system and more than half of the increase in the state prison system between 1985 and 2000, the period of the drug war's greatest escalation. Drug convictions have increased to more than 1,000% since the drug war began. I mean, to get a sense of how large a contribution the war on drugs has made to mass incarceration, consider this. There are more people in prisons and jails today just for drug offenses than were incarcerated for all reasons in 1980. Now, most Americans violate drug laws in their lifetime. Most do. It's a fact. But the enemy in this war has been racially defined. Not by accident, this drug war has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color, even though studies have consistently shown now for decades that contrary to popular belief, People of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites. Or sell. Now, that defies our basic racial stereotypes about who a drug dealer is. I mean, be honest with yourself. If you imagine a drug dealer, who do you see? If you're like most Americans, you imagine some black kids being a street with pants at now, plenty of drug dealing happens in the hood, but it happens everywhere else in America as well. The research shows that drug markets, much like American society generally, are fairly segregated by race. Black folks tend to sell to black, white folks tend to sell to white folks, Latinos to each other. Drug markets are even segregated to a significant degree by class. University students sell to each other, right? <laughs> Drug dealing happens in every community of all colors, in all classes, but those who do time for drug crime are overwhelmingly black and brown. In fact, right here in Illinois, up to 90% of all drug offenders sent to prison have been one race, African American. Now, I find that most people, when they see the data, and say, mm, that's a shame. Yeah, that's a shame, those disparities, that's, that's a problem. But you know, we gotta do something about those drug dealers, those violent offenders in the hood. 